Well, good morning again, Meadowbrook Church. Like I said, it is really good to be back. Um, as many of you know, I've been gone the last three weeks. We've been doing a series with other churches in the area, just highlighting the unity of the church. And so that sent me to three different churches through the month of January. And while it was fun to see other churches and be in other places, what it really reminded me is that I love Meadowbrook Church. Like, I love this church. I love being your pastor. And I am so glad to be back this morning. And so one of the other things that uh, people have been asking me as we move through the month of January is like, hey, we started in this big series in Romans back in the fall. Are we going to jump back into Romans? And the big answer is yes, we will. We're going to start back in in March. We have this one other series that we're doing. We're trying to be really intentional with where our church is at. And I think, you know, you'll be able to get the pieces as to why that is as we move through just this morning and the rest of the series. But for this morning, we're going to be in, in John 1, starting in verse 35. So I oftentimes Times get a little sad around this time of year. And the reason being is there is no more regular football on TV. Like, I love football. I played football in high school. I wasn't that good, but I was a starting quarterback, which was a lot of fun. Um, it wasn't as though, hey, we have this great quarterback and let's put him up as like Brian will do. Like, we don't have anybody else. He's not the worst guy, he'll do. But I just grew up loving football. And so when beginning part of February rolls around, I'm like, oh, I, I can't watch football when I go home from church on Sunday afternoons. But I also love football movies, so sometimes that's a good substitute. And one of my favorite football movies is Friday Night Lights. It came out in, in 2004, and it's a story of, uh, a true story of football culture in small town Texas. So it focuses on one small town one high school, one football team, and tells the story of these football players and how big of a deal football is to them and how many of them try and use football as a way to kind of better their life, get out of their small town, and, and maybe make it in the world. And so I went to go see this movie. I was in grad school when it came out. I went to go see it with some buddies and just loved it. It was wonderful. It was great. Everything I'd hoped it would be. And then two years later, they took the movie and made it into a TV show. Anybody ever get hooked on the TV show, Friday Night Lights? Yeah, it's a great TV show. And I had a friend of mine named Dave, and Dave and I were in grad school together. We went to go see the movie together, and when the show came out, he goes, bro, he's from California, so he always called me bro. He's like, bro, you gotta watch this show. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, it's amazing. Now, Friday Night Lights was first a book, right? And they say when you take a book, and you turn it into a movie, oftentimes the phrase is, well, the book was better, right? right? The book was just better because it's more detail, more involved. And so if you take a book and then turn it into a movie and then turn it into a TV show, usually the quality of the storyline goes down. And so I resisted watching the show. I'm like, I don't want to ruin the movie for myself by watching a crummy TV show. It was a great movie. I'm not going to do it. So for years, I resisted. That was like 2006. Then fast forward to like 2000. 14. It was a Sunday afternoon. Our kids were young enough where they were all still napping. I was just lying on the couch, flipping through cable, right? Cable was still a thing for us back then. And I just happened to come across some random rerun of the TV show Friday Night Lights, and instantly I was hooked. I mean, I was taken by the characters, the way they filmed it. And I was like telling this to another friend of mine, and he's like, you're never going to guess what I have. I was like, what do you have? He's like, I have the whole series on DVD, right? Like who watches DVDs anymore? But he had them. And so I was like, I will take all of them. And Becky and I just started binge watching this show, staying up to like one in the morning, two. In, like, I'm like, I got to see what happens next. And, and I tell you all this because there are times in life when somebody puts an opportunity or an invitation in front of us and we, we pass on that opportunity or invitation, not really knowing what we're passing on. So for me, it was real trivial, right? It was a TV show that I resisted watching and didn't want to watch. But sometimes it can be something really big. Like somebody says, hey, uh, come into this business venture with me. We're going to like start a new business. And it seems too risky. And you say no, but then it like explodes and makes tons of money. And sometimes in those moments when you pass on opportunity, you don't have a great idea of what you've passed on. But sometimes you come to later learn like, oh, I can't believe I passed on that. And oftentimes when we pass on opportunity, we don't get a chance to go back and redo it. 
Most of the times when we pass on opportunity, it's like it's long gone. And the reason I tell you all this is we're in a moment as a church where I think we have incredible opportunity in front of us. Incredible opportunity. And one of our hopes as a staff is to invite you into the present opportunity that we have so that you don't miss out on what God is doing in our midst. And so what we're doing with this series is trying to name that opportunity and invite you into it. And you might be thinking, okay, what is that opportunity? Well, I think as we go through this morning and as we go through this series, I think you'll be able to see exactly what that opportunity is. And our hope is that you will take us up on it and you will engage with what God is doing in our church. Because I think I've been biased the five years that I've been here. So, but I tell people all the time, now is an incredible time to engage with Meadowbrook Church. There are so many good things on the horizon for our church that God is doing, and we want everybody to be fully engaged. And so here's how our passage starts this morning. This is John chapter 1, starting in verse 35. It says, The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. Now the John in this passage is not John the disciple, It's not John who wrote the book of John, but it's John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was a prophet called by God to prepare the way for the Messiah. Now, in Israel's Old Testament, in the narrative of their history, Israel was waiting for their Messiah. And it was thought that it would be an individual who would bring peace and salvation, not just for Israel, but through Israel, to the entire world. So Israel in Jesus' time lived with this anticipation and expectation of our Messiah is coming. When is he coming? And the the title for the Savior was Messiah, which simply means anointed one. And so through the early part of John's ministry, John the Baptist's ministry, people are asking him, are you the Messiah? Are you the anointed one? Are Are you the one we're expecting? And he would say, no, 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 no. I'm only preparing the way for the Messiah. And one of the ways that he was preparing the way for Jesus was to gather disciples, gather disciples and then baptize them with the hope of someday handing those disciples off to Jesus. In John 1, this passage is one of those handoff moments. As we read this in verse 36, when he, right, being John the Baptist, saw Jesus passing by. Now, we're not told where they are. Maybe they're out in the marketplace. Maybe they're in a synagogue. Maybe they're in a neighborhood. But he sees Jesus passing by kind of in the distance. And then he said, look, the Lamb of God. Now, it's interesting that he says Lamb of God rather than look, there's the Messiah, which is probably a reference to, you know, what Jesus will do in his vocation as the Messiah meaning he will be the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He says that earlier in in chapter 1. And after John points out that there's Jesus, there's the Messiah, there's the Lamb of God, those who are disciples, who are with John, do this. Verse 37, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Now, usually when a gospel writer talks about an individual following Jesus. They're talking about somebody making a commitment to be a student or disciple of Jesus and really undergo some significant life change, right? We think of the Apostle Paul in Acts, right? This guy who is like murdering the church and hunting down the church and imprisoning the church, and then he has this massive life change and becomes a follower of Jesus. Well, here, that's not what we're talking about. Like, these guys are actually literally following Jesus from a distance, just creeping on Jesus, right? Kind of scoping him out. They're curious. They're following him. They're like, if that's the guy, where's he going? And Jesus can sense this, And so he turns around in verse 38 and says to them, those who are following, he said, what do you want? What do you want? Now, in this passage, Jesus will say three things. There are three things that Jesus will say. And the first is this question, what do you want? And in this context, it can seem like a pretty insignificant question, right? 
Because in this context, that question, what do you want, could be interpreted as though he's saying, hey, can I help you? Like, I I sense that you guys are kind of like scoping me out, you're following me, you're wondering what's going on, can I help you? But the question, what do you want, I think is a very intentional question from Jesus. And as you read through the gospel accounts, he will say it and ask it multiple times. And I think there's intentionality with that because I think Jesus knows that we actually are driven more by what we want than what we know to be true. We are driven more by our desires than we are what information we have stored up in our brain. We're driven more by what we want than what we know to be true. Here's an example of that. So many of you know we uh, have recently made some hires in the last couple months. Uh, Chris uh, Hogan, who's our new executive director, it's been great having him um, on staff the last couple months. Uh, if you haven't met him, make sure you introduce yourself to him. So in order for me to get to my office, I have to walk by his office. One of the things that Chris has brought is all sorts of like logistical help. He has also brought Reese's peanut butter cups to the office. I mean, he has this big jar of Reese's peanut butter cups in his office, and I love Reese's peanut butter cups. Recently, he's got Valentine ones, so they're like shaped like hearts, which I actually like better than the cups themselves. So like every time I walk by his office, I've like found myself going in to grab a handful of Reese's peanut butter cups. I think I've eaten more peanut butter cups in the last two weeks than I have in my entire life. I love them. I know. Here's the thing. I know. I know in my head that I should not eat 10 of them a day. Like, I know that, but they're just there, and it's convenient, and I want them. So what do I do? I continue to take them. I'm eating them. I'm like, Brian, you should not be doing this. I'm like, I know, but I love them, right? (laughs) Meaning, we are driven by what we want more than what we know. Our desires oftentimes trump knowledge because we're driven by desire, sometimes more than knowledge. And I think this is also true when it comes to people making decisions about churches. Like, we evaluate almost all decisions in life based on what we want. And when it comes to looking for a church, I think people do the same thing. And since 2020, you talk to any pastor they will say that what the American church has experienced in the last year and a half is what we call the church shuffle. Now, there's no shame in this. Some of you are new to our church, and we are so glad that you are here. There are other people who have been a part of our church who have gone elsewhere. So we're not naming that this is a problem or that this is something wrong. We're just naming like this is reality. Because what the pandemic and the shutdown of 2020 did was it gave everybody— all across the world to reevaluate all sorts of things in life. And church and their faith was one of those things. And when everything went online, it made it super easy and super convenient for everybody in our country to check out other churches and to say, so, so where do I really want to be? Like, really, where do I want to worship? What is it that I want? And again, there's no judgment here. It's just that happened for everybody. And the thing is, as we explore new churches, because we live in a consumeristic world, we come into a new church and we have the mindset of a consumer. So we evaluate churches based on our preferences. What is it that I want? What is it that I don't want? How does the pastor look? How does he sound? How does the worship sound? Do they have good coffee? Are there good programs for my kids? All of these things get evaluated. And it's not just a congregational thing, right? Meaning pastors do this too. If you were to tell pastors, hey, we want you to serve this church over here, they might be like, no, no, no. Like, I don't want to serve that kind of church. Because naturally we all have preferences about things. So I'm not naming that this is a bad thing. It's reality. But here's the thing that you have to be mindful of as you're entering into a new church. And that is simply, when it comes to exploring a new church, if you come in with a consumeristic mindset and you remain a consumer of a church and you fail to become a contributor to a church, you can easily become a critic of a church. 
Let me say that again. If you remain a consumer of a church and fail to become a contributor to a church, you can easily become a critic. And then all you do is point out all the things they don't do well, that they don't do right, that don't match or meet your preferences. And Jesus isn't calling people to be consumers of anything. Jesus is calling people to be contributors to his mission in the world. And so Jesus asked the question in this passage to these disciples, what do you want? And their response to him is this in verse 38. They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? To which Jesus replied in verse 39, come, he said, and you will see. So what I love about Jesus is that he never forces himself on anyone. He never forces himself on people and says, you must do this. The way that Jesus often operates is through invitation. He's always inviting people to come see, come explore, come be with me, come to me and you'll find rest, come to me and you'll find peace and salvation. He's always inviting people. He gives people the freedom to choose, but that invitation is always there. And, and we would say that's something that we desire to be true of our church, right? Like it's in our mission statement, right? If you've never read our mission statement, this is what it is. Meadowbrook Church exists to invite people to discover Jesus so that they can become his fully devoted followers who influence the world. And you'll notice that there are four words that carry the weight of that statement, invite, discover, become, influence. We want to be a church that is invitational, to people. Say, come, come and see, come explore, come discover who Jesus is. And here, Jesus is extending an invitation. And, and the reason why that's in our mission statement is because that's who Jesus is, and that's what Jesus does. He's continually inviting people into his life. And that's what he's doing here. He's saying, come and see. And, and we would say that Jesus invites people constantly to two things. The first is relationship. Jesus is always inviting people into relationship. And that seems to be what's happening here. Because he says to these guys, hey, come and see where I'm staying. And then we read this. So they went and saw where he was staying. And they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. They just spent time hanging out with Jesus. You see in Mark 3, when Jesus calls the 12, when he appoints the 12 disciples who become the apostles, it says in Mark 3 that Jesus called them, he names them, and he called them, first and foremost, to be with him. Jesus' primary calling in our life is relationship to him, to be with him, to build relationship, to build intimacy, to build connection with him. But the other thing that Jesus calls us to not only is relationship, but it's also responsibility. It's the responsibility of contributing to his mission in the world. Because there comes a point in the gospel narrative where Jesus leaves. He says, I'm out of here. He's only been around for three years. There's still tons of work to do. And he says to the disciples, you're the ones. You are the ones who have to do this. He says, you are going to be my witnesses in the world. He calls us to relationship as well as to responsibility to bear the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. And in this moment, that's kind of happening as well, because this is what we read in verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and to tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. So the first thing Andrew does is go home and tell his brother Simon, hey, we've found the Messiah. That's part of our responsibility, to simply tell people about Jesus, introduce people to Jesus. But he doesn't just tell him about Jesus. Verse 42 says this, and he brought him to Jesus. He brought him. He took him to meet Jesus. See, when we're inviting people to be a part of Meadowbrook Church, we're not inviting people to discover Meadowbrook Church. We're not inviting people to come hear a certain speaker. We're not inviting people to come feel good about themselves. We're not even inviting people to join our kids' programs. We're inviting people to discover Jesus. 
Because Jesus is the one who changes people's lives. And you see that happening here. You see Andrew bringing his brother Peter to Jesus. And what happens in this moment, Peter gets a whole new sense of who he is. Because there's three things that Jesus says in this story. What do you want? He says, come and see. And then he says, you will be called. He gives a new identity to Peter. This is what we read, the last part of verse 42. Jesus looked at him, Simon, and said, You are Simon, son of John, and you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. And so Simon is given a new name, Peter, which means rock. And later in his ministry with Jesus, Jesus again will look at Peter and say, Peter, you are Peter. On this rock, speaking of Peter, I will build my church. Meaning, he's giving him a new identity that starts to shape Peter's contribution and role in Jesus' mission in the world. And so here's what this sermon series is all about. It's a reminder to us as we're coming out of this pandemic that Jesus' calling is to be contributors to his mission in the world. The calling that we have on our life isn't just to attend a church, but it's to be contributors to what's happening in our community, in this church, and all across the world with God's work in the world. And sometimes for some of us, that means God will call you to another place. You'll actually have to up and move, or maybe he'll call you to be a missionary and you go to the other side of the world. But for many of us, it's going to be a calling to be on mission right where you are, in your own backyard. And what we're doing with this series is we're simply trying to make connections for people. That what happens here with our church is part of that mission. Like sometimes we think mission is something that happens not on a Sunday morning, right? Once we get into the work world on Monday, that's when mission begins. Well, we would say, no, it's much more holistic than that. Like part of being on mission with Jesus is what happens on Sunday morning. Because this is part of shaping our understanding of who we are. It's about inviting people into this space with us so they can hear about Jesus and discover Jesus. It happens holistically, not just out in the world, but also with what we do on Sunday morning. And so one of the things we're also wanting to do with this series is highlight different ministries that we have that we need help in. Because we have found as the church shuffle of 2021 and 2022 continues, we're finding ourselves saying like, man, like who's a part of our church? Like I was talking to a pastor just yesterday and, and we were talking about this and he said, we are wrestling through the exact same thing. Who, like who's with us? Who's invested? Who's involved? And again, none of this is intended to be a guilt trip. Everybody's at a different spot in their journey and everybody has different things that they're working through. We just want to name that as a church, we have this incredible opportunity in front of us to shape the future of our church, to impact the community around us, to be a light to the world, and introduce them to Jesus, trusting that he will be the one to change their lives.